Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, welcome and thank you all for attending today's webcast program, Diagnosing and Monitoring Inflammatory Bowel Diseases. My name is Catherine Soto, and I am the National Manager of Education Programs for CCFA. This program is supported by a sponsorship from Medtronic, formerly known as Given Imaging. I would like to address a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. For those joining us via web, this program will include interactive polling questions, which you will be prompted to answer throughout the program. If you are having difficulties, please dial audience support at the number you see on the right side of your screen, 1-800-215-0364, event ID 102-5590. If you prefer to listen via telephone, you may dial 855-795-1569, conference ID 876-57956. After the presentation, we will open up the program for your questions. We will take as many questions as time allows from webcast participants. If we are not able to take your question, our IBD Help Center can be reached Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time by calling 1-888-694-8872. Upon exiting today's program, you will be prompted to complete a brief program survey. We ask that you please take a few moments to provide your responses as your feedback is extremely important to us as we plan for future educational activities. I now have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight's program, Dr. Sunanda Kane. Dr. Kane is Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Kane received her medical training at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical College in Chicago, Illinois, and completed her fellowship training at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Dr. Kane also holds a master's degree in biostatistics and epidemiology. She has served as the chairman of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's National pa Patient Education Committee. Her work includes caring for patients with inflammatory bowel diseases, and her area of interest include gender-specific issues in gastroenterology and medication adherence. Dr. Kane, thank you for joining us, and it is now my privilege to turn the program over to you. Well, thank you, Catherine, and welcome, everybody. I just want to, uh, again, say that this is a program supported by Medtronic, which is formerly Given Imaging. And tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk, ab pro talk about and provide an overview of inflammatory bowel diseases, which includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and then discuss the diagnostic process and various tests to help monitor your disease, including blood tests that can be routine and specialized, stool tests, endoscopy, and radiology scans. And then we'll spend a few minutes talking about just um, some review tips about what to do to prepare, prepare for your visits to the physician or your provider, and also about testing. So what is IBD? Let's start with a definition. So inflammatory bowel diseases are chronic, i.e. lifelong conditions that cause inflammation in the digestive system, or as we know, the gastrointestinal or GI tract. And this includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Collectively, 1.6 million Americans have one form of IBD or the other. That's, that equals one in every 200 people, and that's 80,000 children across the U.S. So one in 200, that's probably one person in your realm of knowledge, at least one person, who has IBD. So we're going to start with a poll question first, and I'd like to know which best describes you. A, I am a patient with Crohn's disease. B, I am a patient with ulcerative colitis. C, I am a friend or family member of a patient with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. D, I am unsure if I have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Or E, no connection, just want more information. So if you could please just respond now. We'll take a few seconds here to wait to see who's on our call with us.
Okay, so I think that's enough time for everybody. So let's look at who's on the call. So uh, a good third of patients have Crohn's disease. Uh, 16 or 17 percent have ulcerative colitis. Another third are family members or friends. So good for you for joining. Uh, One percent aren't sure, and then eight and a half percent or so are just curious. So welcome everybody. Okay, so let's first talk about symptoms of IBD, and these really can vary from person to person. So just because someone has Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis does not mean in any way that they are going to experience the same thing as somebody else who has Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis sitting next to you in that doctor's office. Common symptoms include frequent or urgent bowel movements because of the inflammation of the GI tract, diarrhea, which can happen for a multitude of reasons, bloody stools, and then abdominal pain or cramping. So those are are the very common symptoms. You don't have to have all of them, or you could have none of them and still have the diagnosis. Because some people actually experience constipation because their intestine is so inflamed that the stool just refuses to come out. Now, it's really important to understand that IBD is not irritable bowel syndrome, which is IBS, Many people are diagnosed with both conditions because they are separate, not the same thing. So that IBS is irritability and IBD is inflammation. So a lot of times doctors or other providers will ask you if you have problems with your eyes, your skin, your joints, and why is that? Well, it turns out that IBD is not just a disease of or condition of the gut. It it can involve a lot of different parts of your body, so outside of the intestine, and can include inflammation of your eyes, of your mouth, where where you have recurrent canker sores, your joints, where you have arthritis-type symptoms, your skin, there are certain kinds of rashes that you can get with this, your bones, i.e. osteoporosis, your kidneys, where, where patients with Crohn's disease are more likely to get kidney stones, and also certain kinds of inflammatory conditions of the liver, most often seen in, um, in males or um, in women who have other autoimmune diseases, they can have liver disease as well as their IBD. So what causes IBD? Boy, you know, if I knew that, I would be on my way to Stockholm to get my Nobel Prize. But what Here we are towards the end of 2015, and we believe that there is a combination of potential factors that are involved with the development. So there's a genetic predisposition. Now, that doesn't mean that IBD is a genetic disease that is carried in the genes, but what it does mean is that there are certain populations of people who have the, 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 the genes that would make it more, make them more susceptible to chronic inflammation, and those people are about 10 to 20 percent of the IBD population. Then there's environmental triggers, so something in the environment makes the the bowels unhappy, and then it's an immune system disturbance that once it becomes unhappy, it stays unhappy, and that it just is like a train off the tracks and just keeps going and is uncontrolled, and that's what causes all of the symptoms and the damage that can happen uh, to the to the GI tract. So when we're trying to make the diagnosis, there's a process that's involved. And so it first includes a medical history and physical exam. So that a lot of the, the, the history, like I said, is going to be about your bowel symptoms, but also asking you about your eyes and your skin and your joints. But it's also going to include timelines. How long have you had the symptoms? Are they stable? Are they getting worse? Do they happen at certain times of the day? And then a full physical exam, which includes a rectal exam. So you uh, should be expecting to have some parts of your body that aren't necessarily usually examined, examined um, if inflammatory bowel disease is actually in um, in the realm of possibility. So once a medical history and physical exam are done, 
those can give clues to the provider of what kind of diagnostic testing needs to be done and also whether IBD is, is a possibility. So that can include blood tests, urine tests, imaging, which would be in the form of x-rays, and what we call endoscopy, which is using a, a lighted flexible tube or scope to examine internally a part of the GI tract. And it's a combination of the medical history, the physical exam, and all of these tests that then make the diagnosis of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And we're, there is a separate slide to talk about biopsies, but I will just say right now that you cannot make the diagnosis of either one of these diseases without a tissue biopsy performed. So, all right, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which one do I have? So what are some of the main differences between the two? So Crohn's disease can affect the entire GI tract from the mouth to the anus. And what that means is that patients who have uh, a lot of problems with rectal pain and large hemorrhoids and fistulas, uh, that includes disease of the anus, and that is associated with Crohn's disease. It, Crohn's disease usually affects the end of the small intestine and the beginning of the large intestine, and that inflammation involves all five layers or the entire thickness of the GI tract, whereas ulcerative colitis only involves the colon, which is the large intestine. It usually begins in the rectum, which is the last portion, and extends more upwards. And so some people who have ulcerative colitis only have it in their rectum, some have it only in a third of their colon, and some people have it in all of their colon. And the inflammation is only in the lining, the innermost lining of the colon, as opposed to Crohn's disease, which involves all five layers of the uh, GI tract. So those are the main differences. Now, I will tell you that that seems pretty simple and straightforward, but there are times when somebody has very bad inflammation of just their colon, which is their large intestine, and the ulcers can be deep and the patient has problems with large hemorrhoids, and it can be very difficult at times to tell whether somebody has ulcerative colitis or whether they have Crohn's disease of their colon because the word colitis, all that means is inflammation of the colon. That's all it means. Ulcerative colitis is a kind of colitis. Crohn's disease of the colon is a kind of colitis and that I ask my medical students on a daily basis when I'm rounding with them, okay, name me five other things that can give you a colitis. And so Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are not the only reasons that someone has inflammation of their colon. And it seems to be a, a, a big topic of, of angst and discussion for patients because they've been told they have both ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, or they've been told, I can't tell. And that's actually about 10% of people, and that's okay because we, we treat that the same way and it's, and it's not that you need a label or anything in order to get treated and feel better. So, again, let's talk about whether IBD or is it something else. Like I said, there are at least five or six other things that can cause inflammation in just your colon. So we always think about what's happening in the other parts of your body and other things that can, that can mimic the same kinds of symptoms of IBD, which can easily be just food poisoning or gastroenteritis, irritable bowel syndrome, where there's irritability but not inflammation, so you get the diarrhea, you get the cramps, you get the pain, but no bleeding, celiac disease, where you have inflammation and you can have diarrhea and weight loss and some of the other joint symptoms and such, but it is not the same kind of inflammation. Gallbladder disease can cause pain uh, in, the, in the upper parts of the body. It can cause diarrhea. It can it cause nausea, vomiting. Stomach ulcers will cause pain, and you can have bleeding. And then certainly um, in older patients or those with family history, a colorectal cancer can actually present as pain or as bleeding. And then we always have to worry about infection, which is why your provider will ask you, how long have you had your symptoms? You, if you have symptoms that have not gone on for at least six weeks, then infection is much more likely than IBD. And some of the things that we are worried about are bacteria that you can get from food that's tainted 
or from water um, or from just being on antibiotics um, or actually from uh, other sources, um, including other people, can, can make you sick. Okay, so what are some of the tests for diagnosis and then actually can we use those to prognosticate people and then to monitor for safety and side effects? So, uh, pop quiz here. Blood and stool analysis can help indicate inflammation in the body. Is this true or is this false? So very good. 87 and a half of percent of you guys said it's true, and that's absolutely true. So let's talk about some of those uh, blood tests and then what you can look for in stool to help indicate inflammation in the body. All right, so there are routine blood tests. And so uh, a lot of doctors will use um, shorthand and they'll say CBC. Well, that stands for complete blood count, and that includes a red blood cell count and a white blood cell count and what that the red cells indicate anemia and the white blood cells indicate if there's an infection. So a CBC is a, a blood test that's routine that can help tell if there's inflammation. Then there are special proteins in the blood that are manufactured by the body when there is active inflammation. And so one of them is called CRP and we doctors love to abbreviate everything, and that stands for C-reactive protein. And then there's the SED rate, which is just a short form for a much longer term. And again, these are blood tests that indicate inflammation. Now, if you get your hand stuck in a car door, you will have an elevated CRP or SED rate because of the inflammation and the swelling of your hand. So these tests are very nonspecific, meaning they'll be elevated for any reason that you have inflammation. So it's up to the provider to figure out if it's elevated or high, what is it that's causing the inflammation. We often do tests for kidney function and liver function, and that's usually to monitor for side effects from medication, but it can also be a diagnostic way to look for um, problems with the kidneys um, if there are, uh, are stones and also if there's inflammation of the liver that may be related or associated with uh, the Crohn's or the colitis. Um, electrolytes, and that would be potassium, sodium, um, um, chloride, calcium, those sorts of things actually are good to help diagnose when people are dehydrated or if they've had a lot of diarrhea, their potassium levels are low, their magnesium levels are low. Vitamin B12 in the blood um, will be low and help diagnose if there's anemia or when someone uh, is not absorbing the vitamins, they will lose it um, and it will be low in their blood as well as vitamin D. That can be a sign for um, bone, min bone mineral loss and is very helpful to us for helping to diagnose problems with the bones. So what are some of the more specialized blood tests? we talk about biomarkers, which is a fancy way of saying that the body has made certain kinds of proteins that can show up in the blood test that help support but do not diagnose IBD. So there are um, certain blood tests that are associated with having the condition, whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. But having said that, they are not 100% foolproof and that there are plenty of people walking around with IBD who do not have these blood tests be positive, and there's plenty of people walking around who don't have IBD and these blood tests are positive. So they are, they're helpful in certain settings, but can be very confusing. Um, and again, they are not for diagnosing. They are for helping to um, indicate which, uh, which disease, um, how active the disease may be, or um, helping to prognosticate that disease. Some um, other ones that we look at are very specialized um, biomarkers that the bio body makes 
they are um, considered antibodies to certain uh, proteins and uh, bacteria, which also can help us prognosticate and identify who may be more at risk for uh, more aggressive disease. And, and this is um, just a thumbnail, very introductory type of uh, introduction to some of these blood tests. And um, it, the science has not all been worked out yet, so um, these are not necessarily things that are ordered on everybody, and they shouldn't be ordered on everybody. Okay, so let's talk about the scoop on poop. So in the stool, we said that, yes, um, you can tell if there's inflammation by looking at the stool. So you can look at the stool, not you, but a lab can look at the stool and examine it for white blood cells. And white blood cells are the cells in, in your bloodstream that help fight infection. And if there's a lot of inflammation or infection, they leak out of the blood cells and the blood vessels into the stool and will come out. And those will, uh, and you don't have to have bloody stools to have white blood cells in the stool. And that's going to tell us that there's inflammation. And most of the time that's going to be infection. And we certainly look for certain kinds of bacteria. Um, we look for the presence of blood, whether it's visible or uh, invisible and digested. We can, we can uh, measure the stool for fat to see if you are malabsorbing or releasing fat. So you may be eating it, absorbing it, and then actually just um, releasing it back through the colon if it's so inflamed. And so you're, you can have a lot of fat in the stool inappropriately. And then there are certain proteins, just like there are proteins in the blood. We can find these proteins in the stool that are leaked by the lining of the colon and the small intestine. And when we see those, we know that there's inflammation as well. So endoscopy is the process by which a trained individual, and it usually takes somewhere between three to five years to be trained to do this adequately, is to uh, insert into either the mouth or through the rectum, a flexible lighted tube that is used to look at the tissue lining, but also can monitor for how effective a treatment is. Because if you scope somebody and it looks terrible and you put them on medicine and you scope them again and it looks completely healed, then we know that we've done our job. We also use endoscopy to monitor patients for cancer when they've had disease for a long time. And so we look um, through the mouth into the stomach and small intestine, and we go up through the rectum and we can see the colon. There is 13 feet of small intestine in between where a normal scope can go from the mouth and a normal scope can go from the rectum. So we got to think about how are we going to monitor and look at those 13 feet. So that's when, oh, well, we'll get to that. So let me just talk a minute about colonoscopy. So that's the scope of the colon. We insert the scope through the anus, and the scope is no bigger than the caliber of basically your pinky finger. And we examine the rectum and the entire colon, and we do this under sedation. And what that means is that people are either given twilight sleep or else a deeper sleep, which means they cannot drive anywhere between 12 to 24 hours after the procedure. And so uh, a family member or a friend does need to come if on the day that you're having one of these procedures. The worst part of a colonoscopy is prepping for it. It's really important that we're not, when we stick our scope in, we're not looking at poop, but that we are looking at the lining of the colon. So what you can do as patients is really be mindful about what you eat a couple of days before the procedure and then making sure that you are on a liquid diet before the procedure and that as, as much as you can, getting down that prep um, to make sure that all of the poop um, is out. So a flexible sigmoidoscopy is just the shorter form of a colonoscopy and because the sigmoid colon is the last part of it. So it's still inserted through the anus and into the rectum, but we're just looking at the bottom third of the colon. And sometimes all you need are enemas to clear out this bottom portion and you don't have to drink everything. And so um, this can be used when patients who have ulcerative colitis, 
We're just trying to figure out whether they're responding to therapy or that their symptoms are just not um, what we um, would expect on therapy, so we're trying to just get a look as well as tissue biopsies. Anytime that you stick a scope into uh, an orifice, there is a small risk for perforation. That's about one in every 6,000 times that we do this. And luckily that uh, most perforations these days can be repaired just by fancy clips and by sewing um, from the inside. And very rarely is an operation ever needed these days. An upper endoscopy is where we use a different kind of scope, and it's much thinner. It still has the light on it, and we go through the mouth and down into the esophagus, the stomach, and then the, what's called the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And the prep for this is way easier because you don't have to you don't have to do any kind of uh, liquid prep. You just can't eat anything four to eight hours beforehand because we need your stomach to be empty. But this is also done with sedation, and so even though it's a much shorter test and you don't have to do very much of a prep, it's still something that you need to have a, a family member or a friend drive you home, and that because of the sedation, no driving yourself for 12 to 24 hours afterwards. Okay, so what's an endoscopic ultrasound? Well, that is another kind of scope test that we do. An ultrasound, and most of you are familiar with, is... Um, is a, is a handheld device that's external and it looks at your gallbladder. It can look in it when women are pregnant, it looks at the baby. But actually, we now have fashioned little ultrasound cameras onto the end of endoscopes and we go into the, um, into the, into the stomach and we can ultrasound, um, in there. Plus, we can do ultrasounds of the rectum to look for fistulas, which are connections of, of the rectum to the outside world and to the anal canal. And an ultrasound done from the inside like this is really helpful for trying to um, help monitor and diagnose people who have bad Crohn's disease. Okay, so I mentioned that we have 13 feet of small intestine in between where we can have the upper scope and then the colonoscopy. So how do we assess that? So one um, really amazing way that has come along probably in the last 10 years or so is video capsule endoscopy, and it's the way that we examine the small intestine. And as it turns out, we now have a capsule for the colon as well, but that's still not really ready for prime time yet. Um, but it is under development. So, but for sure, FDA approved is the um, video capsule endoscopy, and that the prep is just a clear liquid diet 24 hours beforehand. And you can see here in the picture what this uh, video capsule looks like. It's about the size of a large multivitamin. You swallow it, and the camera takes thousands upon thousands of photos as it travels through your small intestine, kind of like the Fantastic Voyage, if uh, some of you remember that movie um, from way back when. And it transmits the photo, the pictures to a recorder that you wear on, your, on a belt that's on your hips outside your body. And then at the end of the day, the camera passes out of your body um, in stool. It's crushed, and so you're not going to necessarily see it the way you swallowed it, and we certainly don't want it back. These are one-time use only. So at the end of the day, you turn in the, um, the, the belt, and then um, we sit and we spend two to three hours reading that capsule endoscopy film to look at the 13 feet of your small intestine. Now, this may not be suitable for patients who we know have narrowings or strictures because the capsule can get stuck, and that's not such a happy situation if it gets stuck. But what we can do is give somebody, it's a gelatin capsule um, beforehand if we're worried about a stricture, and the gelatin capsule will collapse and just dissolve, and that if it doesn't come out within a day, we know that it's probably not a good idea to give somebody a real capsule. Um, but uh, at Mayo, what we usually do is we're doing some sort of x-ray before a video capsule study. So x-rays are really useful for detecting blockages of the small or the large intestine. And x-rays come in different forms. You can have 
just what we call a plain x-ray, where all we do is just take um, an x-ray of your belly. Those are the kinds that they usually do in an emergency room situation. Um, there are CAT scans and there are MRIs. And I think that that's a whole nother talk to just talk about the differences um, between those different kinds of things. So suffice it to say, we'll, we'll touch upon each one of them in, in brief here. So a barium contrast study is actually um, getting a little old-fashioned now, but sometimes they can be very helpful. And it, it depends on which part of the body we're trying to look at. We will do um, an upper GI series if we are worried about a stomach ulcer or something in your esophagus. What's called the small bowel series where we'll have you drink the barium and we're looking at your 13 feet of small intestine. A small bowel enterocolitis, which is another test that looks at your entire small intestine, but also not only do we give you the contrast, but then we put actually a little tube down your nose and we put in air along with that contrast. And it's a very uncomfortable test, but it can be really, really helpful if we're trying to find an area of a kink or a narrowing that's been elusive to us in other ways. And that's a pretty highly specialized test that's not done everywhere. And then a lower GI or a, uh, or a barium enema is where barium goes up your rectum and we can look at your colon that way. And um, there still are very good reasons to do a lower GI um, and that, um, that you want to have that done, again, in a place that the radiologists are very um, expert at that. So those are the barium studies. And then we talk about cross-sectional imaging. And why do we use that fancy term? It's because we're getting a lot of images where it looks like the body's been sliced or cross-sectioned open. And that is the CT. Um, and a specialized kind of CT called a CT enterography. So we have amazing um, technology now that can reconstruct um, the 13 feet of bowel with the right kind of contrast in it and get 3D pictures of the small intestine. And that can be really helpful for people who have um, suspected Crohn's disease or for those who have Crohn's disease and we're trying to monitor how well their therapy is working or look for a stricture. So the C, a plain CT is very helpful when you want a very global overview of the abdomen, and that's usually what they're going to do in an emergency room. But a CT enterography, again, is a way to reconstruct with images um, the 13 feet of bowel from the outside. An MRI... Um, it used to be a very, very highly specialized test. There were only a few centers that would do these, and now they're much more available. And the nice thing about MRIs is that there's no radiation involved. So when patients have IBD and they need a lot of tests over their lifetime, you can imagine the concern about their radiation exposure. And so we like to do MRIs instead of CTs whenever possible because we can still identify that inflammation and the fistulas and obstruction and the narrowing. Um, and it's very similar to CT scanning, but again, there's no radiation. The, and that's the upside. The, the downside is that an MRI machine, at least some of them still, are, in, are, are very um, claustrophobic inducing experiences where the tube is just a few inches from your nose and that can be very disturbing to a lot of patients. There are places that have quote unquote open MRIs, but um, that those are not widely available everywhere and that they are not as good for certain kinds of tests, particularly um, when we want to do an enterography like the CT enterography or when we want to do an MRI of the liver and pancreas that you can't use an open MRI um, kind of protocol for that. So um, you're not getting radiated, but for people who may be prone to claustrophobia, that sometimes we give people a little Valium before they have that test. So, okay, just a, a very quick shout about cancer. And you may read on the Internet or have heard that if you have IVD, you are at greater risk for getting cancer. And that's true. Um, the more disease you have in your colon, 
then the, the, the greater the risk. However, patients who have a family history in their families are, have a higher risk than those patients who just have IBD. So it's really important to understand what your specific individual risk may be. So it depends on how much inflammatory bowel disease you have. Is it in your small intestine or in your colon? How much of your colon is involved? How active is the inflammation? And how long have you had the disease? Because all of those factors play into what your risk is. We used to think that cancer was almost inevitable after about 30 years of disease. And that was because we didn't have great ways of controlling inflammation. And as we have gotten way better at cont containing this and understanding what leads to cancer and doing surveillance colonoscopies in order to catch polyps before they turn into cancers, that the risk for cancer, while it is increased, is nowhere near the risk that we used to think. And so what is the risk? So we say that a patient who has ulcerative colitis for greater than 10 years of their entire colon without any other family history has per two or three years a 1% increased risk compared to their next door neighbor of the same age. So while it is true that there's an increased risk, it is not anything that is that should be considered inevitable or a, a reason to um, be fearful of, uh, of, of dying of that complication. So just going back, because we t uh, when I mentioned that you have to have a tissue biopsy before we make the diagnosis of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, it's not enough to have an x-ray or um, a video capsule study picture, you need tissue to make this diagnosis. And that's a biopsy, which is a sample removed and looked at under a microscope. Several biopsies are even more helpful. And the biopsies are going to show certain kinds of, and types of inflammation. And these are also what we take during colonoscopy to look for those precancerous cells and the polyps. There is a very small risk of bleeding from when we take our biopsies, but in patients who have otherwise normal blood counts, who are not on blood thinners, that that bleeding risk is extremely small and is not outweighed by the, um, the effect and the benefit of having that tissue sample done. So, okay, so we've talked a little bit of science now, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about some how to manage your IBD if you have it in conjunction with your healthcare team. So here's another question, and I have a feeling I already know how this is going to look, but how comfortable do you feel discussing concerns about managing IBD with your doctor and your healthcare team? A, very comfortable, B, comfortable, C, somewhat comfortable, or D, not comfortable at all? So I'll give you guys a little time to answer. Okay. Well, you know, I'm very surprised at this answer. I'm thrilled with this answer. So that um, almost 69% of you, so two-thirds, over two-thirds, said they were very comfortable. 20% or a fifth said comfortable. 12% are somewhat. And nobody answered not comfortable. So we have obviously a very educated um, audience here. And, and so this is great that you feel like this. Because the folks that I see in my practice, that's why I said I would be, I was expecting most of the people to say C, somewhat comfortable, and that a good portion would say not comfortable at all because of just the, the nature of some of the things that need to be discussed. Okay, so scheduling tests. Um, when we schedule tests. The results may be um, needed as soon as possible, but also um, we have to consider when we're going to do them. Is this for initial diagnosis? Is this for flares? Or is this 
routine in terms of surveillance for making sure that there isn't any precancer or cancer there. So you always want to um, ask your provider, well, so why are we doing this? A, a test should be performed because it's going to change management. To, to have a scope just to have a scope is not a good reason to have a scope. Tests may be clustered together, and that might be very helpful and convenient to do. But you also want to make sure that you ask about any special instructions ahead of time, because you certainly do not want to have a barium x-ray study scheduled for you right before you're supposed to have a colonoscopy, because there's just going to be barium in you if you have that done first. So make sure that you've asked, are there special dietary instructions? Do I have to stop some of my medicines? And then, um, of course, you just have to keep in mind the availability of the results may vary. So if biopsies are taken, those have to be sent to the pathologist. They have to be prepared on the, on, um, on the slides and stained and looked at. And so that can be anywhere between 24 hours to um, several days. So even though we're looking right away at the lining, it could be several days or even a week or so before we have final answers. So just keep that in mind. So when you're preparing for your visit, and it doesn't sound like I have to tell anybody in this audience about preparing, that you want to make a prioritized list of questions because there's only going to be a certain amount of time and the provider is going to have an agenda and you will have an agenda. So make sure that if you have a question, a list of 20 questions, that you've put the number one, two, and three at the top, not 17 and 18 and 19, because you may not get to those questions. Um, you may want to write down your symptoms um, or some um, things that you've been experiencing, which may be side effects that you may not know are side effects, but things that you're experiencing. So that can be very helpful. And it, and it would be really great if you could bring somebody else with you because a second pair of ears is always um, a good thing. So there is a really nice app out there and it's actually developed for the CCFA. It's called GI Buddy and it helps you keep track of your medical history, which is so helpful because it's really easy to lose track of time, as you know, and the dates of, now when did I have that blood test? When did I start having symptoms again? So this is a really handy way to do that. You can keep track of your treatment so that when I see a patient and they say, I've been on every treatment that there is, I, I, I'm pretty sure that they haven't, but then they can't t list off the medicines that they've been on and they certainly don't have a good sense of how long they were on them or when they were introduced. Again, your symptoms or what you're experiencing can be tracked. The names and contact information of your healthcare team can be on here. And it can all be stored electronically, which is really nice. And guess what? It's free. It's available um, as an iPhone app um, or on a computer here at uh, www.ccfa.org slash GI Buddy. All right, so what do you want to ask your provider? What do, what do I want to hear my patients ask me? Again, what's the purpose of the test? Because I just told you that you want to have a test that's going to help change management so that if it's not going to do anything except appease the curiosity of your provider, probably not a good reason to have it. What happens if we get a positive result? Are you going to change my medicine? Are you going to stop a certain medicine? What's going to happen? Again, how do I prepare for this test so that it's not canceled? How long is it going to take? Can I come by myself or do I have to have somebody? And how long will it take before I get the results? And who's going to be giving them to me? Because if it's just that the secretary is going to call me with the results, my secretary is not going to have medical training to be able to answer follow-up questions that you may have, but my nurse or certainly I would. So take-home points. IBD is a chronic condition that causes inflammation in the digestive tract. There are many tests that we use to diagnose and then monitor IBD and to help rule out other things. It's really important, and it sounds like this um, group of, of folks on the call certainly um, feel comfortable asking their physicians about things. So having a good relationship is super important. And 
you're not going to know, you're, you're going to be the person who knows your disease the best and keeping track of it um, is going to be the way that you're going to be able to say, hey, you know what, I'm having diarrhea, but this is different than my usual flare, or this pain is different, or no, nope, this is the same thing, and I think it's because I ate XYZ last night. So that's going to be the way that over time you're going to be able to manage your disease really effectively in conjunction with your providers. So the diagnosis leads to treatment. We've already talked about how we, okay, so we diagnose it, and it's a whole other talk about IV treatment, whether that's medical, dietary, surgery, or other things. Um, but it's really important to have the right diagnosis, and then that is what then leads to correct treatment. So I'm going to leave here uh, with just the references um, uh, on this page here. There are resources available to you, and uh, certainly uh, uh, appreciate you spending your time um, this evening, if you're um, anywhere on the, the West Coast, um, it's early evening. If you're, um, it, if you're calling from Europe, it's the middle of the night already. But I certainly appreciate you guys taking your time to, to be here. And it looks like, Catherine, we're ready to take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Kane, for your informative presentation. It is now time for the question and answer part of our program. And for everyone's benefit, please keep your questions general without many personal details so Dr. Kane can provide an answer that is general in nature. In the interest of time, I also ask that you keep your questions related to the topic. You are always welcome to contact the IBD Help Center if you have other questions. If you are joining us by web, simply click on Ask a Question and type in your answer, then hit Submit. Our first question uh, is, after years of having been diagnosed with UC, ulcerative colitis, my GI doctor will suggest yearly colonoscopies. At what age do yearly colonoscopies stop, and are there more problems in the elderly? Okay, so that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So um, it, we do colonoscopies annually for those patients who have had disease, ulcerative colitis for longer than 10 years. And if you got the diagnosis when you were 20, then you've had your diagnosis for 10 years at age 30, and we would be doing colonoscopies into the foreseeable future. If you got your diagnosis at 60, 10 years of disease is age 70. And, and it really does come down to the overall other health issues that you may have. How safe is it to do that colonoscopy? And do we care if there are polyps? So that if you are a healthy 85-year-old, we'll keep doing screening colonoscopies. If, um, if you are an unhealthy 40-year-old who has diabetes and heart disease and a lot of other issues, then perhaps doing looking for small polyps is not the right way to go. So um, everybody is individualized. We, we say, though, that if you are interested in being surveyed and preventing cancer, then every one to two years after 10 years of disease is when you have a colonoscopy. Great. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is, how important is it to test efficacy of certain medications, like biologics, in the blood? Okay, so I think the question is, is how, what are the reasons why we do blood levels of drugs? And so it's to, um, we do blood, blood monitoring when we are concerned that the drug is not working. So somebody is having symptoms that could be active disease, but we're not sure. And so uh, the blood levels may be a, a bit of information to help us know whether um, if there's adequate drug that, that the symptoms may not be active disease, but if there's adequate drug and we know that there's active disease, that that drug's not working anymore, and so we'd have to switch it. So um, we do blood work, blood levels, when, again, it's going to change management. We don't just randomly do them to see, are you, if you're well, I don't care what your blood level is. Great, thank you. 
The next question is, can you explain indeterminate colitis, and how do I get a definitive diagnosis? <laughs> so, okay. Um, so indeterminate colitis is a fancy way of saying we don't know. That's the 10% of people who have some features that look like ulcerative colitis and some features that look like Crohn's disease, and that it's really a coin flip. And I know it can be somewhat disturbing or unsettling for a patient to be told they have indeterminate colitis, but that at the end of the day, what that means is that you have an inflamed colon and that we need to ge to to gear our, our therapies and our management towards healing that colon. And that um and, and that it's just the nature of the beast that that ten percent of the time that even experts like myself can can say, I just I I'm just not sure. Great, thank you. Our next question question will actually be a video question. So I will uh, allow the video to play, and then Dr. Kane, I will repeat the question for you and for those joining us via phone. Hi. Hi, my name is Emily Morgan, and I have colitis. My question is about colonoscopies. Do regular routine colonoscopies determine risk for colon cancer, or is a different procedure needed to figure all of that out? Also, if I'm at risk for colon cancer, how often are these procedures recommended? Okay, so the question was uh, from Emily, who has ulcerative colitis, and she asked, do routine colonoscopies determine any risk for colon cancer, or is a separate test needed to determine that? Also, if I am at risk, how often is this procedure recommended? Okay, so, all right. The reason that we do colonoscopy is because we can sample the tissue, uh, sample the lining of the, sa the lining of the colon, and what we're trying to find are abnormalities of the lining before it turns into something more serious like cancer. So we're looking for small polyps, we're looking for um, um, abnormal even cells just under um, the, the light of the scope. And so you cannot um, be screened for cancer um, adequately with ulcerative colitis by doing the stool test or by swallowing a camera. This has to be done with tissue sampling. And again, your risk for cancer is based on how long you've had the disease, how much of your colon is involved, how active the inflammation has been over time, your family history, and some of your other health habits. So people who eat a lot of red meat, people who don't eat a lot of, of, of fiber, um, people who have high cholesterol diets are thought to be at greater risk for colon cancer. Obese patients are more at risk for colon cancer. Um, smokers are more at risk for colon cancer. So it, it's, again, an individualized risk uh, assessment based on lots of different factors. Thank you. We have one more video question, and I will again la allow that to play and repeat the question for our phone audience. Hi, my name is Molly, and I have Crohn's. I've been considering doing a pill camera, and I just wanted to know a little bit more about the risks of it being stuck inside of me. I also wanted to know in what situations would that pill camera be recommended? So the question was from Molly, who has Crohn's disease, and she's asking or considering doing a pill cam capsule test, but is nervous about it being lodged somewhere in her body. What are the risks of this happening, and what, in what cases would the pill cam be recommended as an option? Okay, so that's a great question. So um, the, 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 the reason that a pill cam can be very helpful is um, when you're concerned about um, CAT scans not being sensitive enough. So if you've had a CAT scan and there's no evidence for narrowings or blockages, the risk of the cams getting the, the video capsule getting stuck is what we, we quote about one to one and a half percent of the time because the x-rays can sometimes not show us a stricture. Um, the video capsule can be very helpful 
when there um, is a question of whether this is Crohn's or whether the, the medication that you're on is helping the Crohn's so that the ulcers have become smaller and um, can also be helpful for assessing whether there's been healing of the, of the lining as well. Um, so the, the, the potential benefit outweighs that one to one and a half percent risk if there's an x-ray that doesn't show a narrowing. And Catherine, I just want to go back um, to, because clearly there's a lot of concern about colorectal cancer um, in ulcerative colitis. Let me just say that as a collection, as a population of patients with ulcerative colitis, that your lifetime risk by just having the diagnosis of cancer is no greater than 5%, okay? So in the U.S., you're just living in the U.S., your risk of getting colon cancer is 1 in 12. And so increasing that by 5% is, is not a huge burden. So while this is considered a complication of ulcerative colitis when you've had it a long time, that, that there's other things that play into it and that, that, that it might be because we do surveillance and we catch abnormalities before they turn into cancer, that, that we have been able to really keep this under, uh, under um, in a manageable um, statistic. Thank you. And we have time for one last question, and it is, if you have ulcerative colitis, can it develop to Crohn's disease? Okay. So that's a very good question, and I appreciate the, the asking because that was something that we didn't quite touch on. So ulcerative colitis is not the same disease as Crohn's disease, all right? So that it can be, though, that what we thought was ulcerative colitis continued because ulcerative colitis only involves the, the superficial inner lining of the colon, but that if, if it progresses and gets worse and it ends up going through all of the layers where you develop a fistula or an abscess or a stricture, then that patient has declared themselves and that it was really Crohn's disease all along. So it's not that somebody who has ulcerative colitis will, quote, unquote, develop Crohn's disease. It was Crohn's disease all along. It just wasn't recognized as such. Getting back to the indeterminate colitis, we actually have very good data of patients who have had indeterminate, a diagnosis of indeterminate colitis, and 10 years later, the majority still have indeterminate colitis. So that if you really can't tell, that's a pretty stable disease that um, the, the key message here is that if there's inflammation, it needs to be treated. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kane, for your insightful presentation and answers to our questions. If your questions were not answered, you can call CCFA's IBD Help Center Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 888-694-8872. Today's recording will be placed on CCFA's website within 48 hours. You will receive an update once this is made available. Upon exiting today's webcast, you will be prompted to complete a brief survey. We ask that you please take a few minutes to provide your responses, as your feedback is extremely important to us as we help plan for future educational activities. I now want to bring your attention to some important uh, CCFA resources that can also help. Your participation in this webinar is a great start in learning to manage inflammatory bowel disease. Our IBD Help Center is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and is also available by email at info at ccfa.org. Or you can chat online with an information specialist directly via answer chat visit www.ccfa.org for more information. If you'd like to watch other educational webcasts on IBD, please visit the website shown on the screen to explore other IBD-related topics. You can also connect with other IBD patients through the CCFA community website at www.ccfa.community.org or by joining a support group or our Power of Two peer mentor program. 
GI Buddy is an online tracking tool and mobile app that has everything you need to stay on top of managing your inflammatory bowel disease. Visit www.ccfa.org for more information. You can also participate in other educational events by connecting with your local chapter. Again, visit www.ccfa.org. Another great resource is CCFA Partners. This patient-powered research network includes a web-based survey that allows patients to easily participate in research, become citizen scientists, and gain access to tools to help track and manage their disease. Become a part of this network today. Visit the website shown on the screen. A great tool to help you is GI Track Card. CCFA is excited to present a new interactive resource for understanding your anatomy and where Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis may be active, the GI Tract Guide. This resource is made possible through an educational grant from Abbey and Kink and sponsorship from Given Imaging and Shire. The GI Tract Guide is viewable on any internet-enabled device, such as a smartphone, tablet, or computer. It is also disease-specific. The guide includes anatomy for all areas of the body. You can walk through the anatomy via the navigation at the bottom of each section or by clicking on a specific section on the body. You can also narrow in on the rectum or GI tract for more specific details in this area. Information is presented in concise bullets specific to each disease and provides details on how this area of the body is affected by IBD. Learn more and utilize this resource at gitract.ccfa.org. And finally, if you are looking for a fun, family-friendly activity to raise mission-critical funds for CCFA, sign up for our Team Challenge Full or Half Marathons or a Take Steps Walk near you. Visit the websites shown on the screen for more information. Before exiting, please remember to complete the program evaluation. And we would like to once again thank Medtronic for their support of today's program. On behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, thank you for joining us. Have a great night.